Hello friends, it's Demi. I know you're probably wondering where that super cool intro music is. Don't worry, the chapter is coming, but first I wanted to share a few things before we get started. Hold on, if your finger is over the fast forward button, take it away. Patience is very important in publishing and I know you're on the edge of your seat and you can't wait to hear Christine and me chat all about line level writing, but there is a whole chapter on patience. Have you heard it? If not, you totally should go listen. And now for my notes. First, Christine was originally at the Purcell agency, which she mentioned in our conversation. And recently she moved to Fine Print Literary. And so I just wanted to share this update in case you are interested in querying her. She is now a Fine Print Literary. And I also wanted to share this just because she mentioned the Purcell agency in the conversation and I wanted you to have the most accurate and up-to-date information. Second, during our conversation, we chatted about a lot of things to watch out for on the line level to elevate your writing and make it very immersive for readers. For this reason, we are really getting deep into what to avoid and what to do more of, what not to do, but we do not want you to take anything we say as the law or set in stone because there will always be exceptions. And as you're working through your manuscript, if you come to a sentence or a certain moment where you feel that you need to go against what is recommended or common, that is totally fine if you have a Jessica vacation for doing so. Our intent is to share things that we see a lot because we both read a lot of manuscripts. Christina is an agent and I'm a freelance editor and these are things that we see a lot that can result in the prose not being as polished as it could be. And so that is our intent to share what we see a lot and to hopefully give you insight into what to look for to make your writing even stronger on the line level. Next, I briefly want to talk about passive voice. If you're on Twitter, you may have seen my editorial thread that went viral in the writing community, and one of the points I made was on passive voice. Christine and I talked about the exact same thing, and since there was some confusion surrounding that point in the thread, I wanted to share a quick clarification just to avoid any further misunderstandings. Every time Christine and I say passive voice, we're not talking about grammar. Yes, that is a grammatical term, but for the purposes of our conversation on line-level writing, we're not talking about grammar. We are talking about the narrative voice itself, the prose, the writing. And when that is passive, it creates a distance for the reader. As writers, our goal is to achieve a deep point of view through immersion and immediacy. And so Christine and I will be sharing in this chapter certain things to watch out for to avoid your voice being passive. And so again, every time we say passive voice, we're not talking about grammar. We are talking about the narrative voice itself. Finally, I want to give a huge shout out to Christine for tackling this topic with me. Most of the literary blend chapters are more free-flowing conversations without much preparation. I go into recording sessions with talking points and a roadmap to keep the conversations on track, but because this is a very craft-focused episode. I really went into it with a plan and Christine did a lot of preparation as well. And so this was a more challenging topic to cover. And it's not intended to come off as an English class because this is a podcast. So that was very important to me to maintain the entertainment quality of the chapter while also making it informative. And I'm so happy that I feel Christine and I achieved that balance perfectly. And so thank you again to Christine for joining me for this chat. And now I will finally flip the page so you can listen to our wonderful conversation on line level writing. I hope you enjoy. Thank you for tuning into Literary Blend, a publishing podcast. I'm your host, Demi Michelle Schwartz. There's no perfect recipe for chasing a dream in the publishing industry but I hope the conversations on this show give you the ingredients you need to bake yours into reality. So let's flip the page and get into this chapter of Literary Blend. Hello friends, welcome back to Literary Blend. Today's chapter is called Line Level Writing. And joining me on the show to cover this very important topic is a guest I'm so excited to chat with. Please welcome Christine Goss. Hi, Christine. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to chat about this. I'm excited to chat about this too. I'm so excited to have you. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing really well. I am not going to lie, a little nervous, but I am excited to be able to kind of share more about line level writing because I think there's so much that needs to be told and shared. How are you doing? Absolutely. I'm fantastic. I'm really excited to get into this conversation. But before we do, I would love for you to share a little about yourself and your journey in publishing so far. Yeah, for sure. So I am an associate uh, literary agent at the Purcell Agency. I got into this as I think a lot of people do when they start writing and realizing, you know, they have a story to tell. And as I started writing and taking it seriously, I got beta readers and uh, started CPing and realized I really loved working with authors on their story and developmental edits and learning more about writing and the craft of writing. And I used to sell audio advertising, which had a similar skill set to what uh, agents do. And so I felt like that it translated really well to agenting. So I reached out to Tina and luckily she took me on and um, I've been able to learn under an owner of an agency. And then I got promoted in October and, and here I am. And um, I couldn't be happier. I, it's amazing to love what you do. Yes, for sure. Well, congratulations, and I'm really excited to see what the future has in store for you as an agent. Oh, me too. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to be an agent one day, potentially, so we will see what happens there. All right, cool, cool. So let's dive into our chat about line-level writing. So to start off, how would you define this in basic terms? It is elevating the craft of writing to a point where it's not just telling a story, but also relating to the reader and really luring them into the story. It's taking what's on the page and immersing the reader. So you're feeling what the character is feeling really just like set in the setting. And it's, for me, it's just taking the difference between feeling like you're reading a book and living in the story. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the biggest reasons why this is important, aside from being able to pull a reader into the story and allow them to immerse themselves and experience that character's journey, is I feel like once you are someone who reads manuscripts a lot, like you're an agent and I'm a freelance editor, we read a lot and it's very, very easy to tell on like the first page if the writing is where it needs to be on the line level Mm -hmm. and I've read quite a few where the story is like fantastic and developmentally it's good but it's just not where it needs to be on the line level Mm -hmm. and I think some authors get frustrated like with agents like how can you stop on the first page well this is why it's the writing that isn't necessarily where it needs to be yeah and there are a few tells and common um mistakes I well I hate saying mistakes because it's hard to know that you're making a mistake when you don't know what line level writing is. And to be honest, it took me a long time until I truly understood what it was. Um, And a lot of times too, it's even in traditionally published books. I mean, most traditionally public books will have at least some form of line level writing and craft. Um, But even then you realize, oh, I'm not connecting with this book. Why? And it's just that that writing is not quite there yet. For sure. Absolutely. And I think you're exactly right. And not necessarily calling them mistakes, but just things that maybe authors don't know. Or sometimes too, I know for me, like when I was really digging into the craft, you can read a book that's like fantastic on the line level, and then you can read your manuscript that needs work. But it's really hard sometimes if you don't know the specifics of what to look for. Like you can tell something's off, but at the same time, you're like, okay, what exactly is it? How can I make actionable changes to apply what needs to be done? And so I know, like, especially when I'm leaving edits for my amethyst ink clients like if there's line level stuff specifically i always give examples and specify exactly what it is and how to fix it because i think if you're not given that direction you may know the problem but not how to fix it oh 100 percent. it's not something that you always notice in your own manuscript because you're so in your head and you figure that you understand what you're saying. And when I read other manuscripts, I identify it so quickly. And I'm like, oh, this is passive voice. But sometimes you need to be called out or just continue to practice and keep writing to unlearn the habits of passive voice and other things that I know we're going to talk about 
uh, that is specific to line level writing. Yeah, for sure. And I totally resonate with that. Literally, I just did a revision and I would see things and I would think to me, you're such a hypocrite. You tell like everybody not to do this and you're doing the same thing. But you're exactly right. right. I think like you need some people to like point it out to you. And once you see it so much, like filter words too, like when I was in school, when I started writing, I used just like every other paragraph and one of my critique partners pointed it out to me and now every time I see it I'm like cut 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 like (laughs) like once you have these things pointing out to you it's like so much easier and especially when you're reading your own writing to really go like line by line and you're right in saying that you have the story so clearly in your head that you really need to separate yourself from that and try to put yourself in the shoes of a reader to experience it from that level and really go line by line and ask yourself and notice what is really on the page and how to strengthen that Mm -hmm. yeah fabulous so let's dive into some specifics so let's first talk about passive voice because that's the one you brought up so what exactly is passive voice christine so for instance in my manuscript um i had a beta reader even just recently call me out on it because i had a sentence where it was like and then i realized that i don't have his number but we're not thinking you know, in our head on a normal day, I'm not sitting here and being like, and I realize I don't know the definition of passive voice, you know? So it's like passive voice is, that's my example of it. I know how to identify it, but I, when it comes to, um, it's so, it can be, it's such a technical term. It's very hard for me to define. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. No, that's a great example. And some things I would like to add to maybe define it if I can. So Please what do. you described is like filtering. <laughs> so that's passive voice. So filtering is when you're putting, everyone calls it narrative distance between the reader and the character. So things like I realized, I saw, I heard, mm-hmm. I noticed, I think that makes the reader realize that they're reading a book because you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't think, oh, I just heard a car horn. You're going to think I heard a car. Like that's a car horn blaring, Mm -hmm. right? So you wouldn't naturally think that as a person. So your character shouldn't either. Um, Another thing with passive voice is uh, this leans into the active verbs as well, which we'll talk about next. But if you said uh, something like, I started to run, started to is passive just say I ran Mm -hmm. uh and also things like verbs ending in ing that contributes to passive voice instead of saying he was walking over to me and just say he walked over to me so I think in that instance like the active voice and the passive voice kind of back and forth that can tie into the verbs because these verbs are active and when they're active then the reader can immerse himself into the story And if they're passive, then that creates a distance between the reader and the character. With the active verb, you're literally in motion with the reader. You're in motion as you, or as with the character, you're in motion as you read. But with passive, you are, there is a distance and kind of like a wall Mm -hmm. uh, that's created. Yeah, for sure. So what are your thoughts on the uh, active verbs? Because that's kind of tied into this. Verbs are very underappreciated. But also, like, rarely used properly, if, you know, if I may say. Um, You know, I think a strong verb is so powerful, but a lot of times I don't think the attention is given to them as they should. Does that make sense? Yes. No, absolutely. Am I making sense? Yeah, you totally are. I think what we can do with verbs is... The more specific your verb is to the situation, you can create a very immediate reaction from the character and you can also show emotion. So like, for example, if Mm -hmm. a character is knocking on a door, right? So if you see the character knocked on a door, that's pretty chill. But if they're pounding on the door, maybe that shows that they're a little angry, right? If they're like tapping lightly, maybe it's late at night and they're trying like maybe someone upstairs is sleeping and they're trying to lightly tap to get someone's attention on the bottom floor. Like the verbs that you use can really show like the tone of the moment and the emotion behind the action being done. And totally immerse the, you know, depending on the POV, like you're understanding the character more by what they're doing with the verb, you know, as when it's used. Right. Um, They're very underutilized and 
but there also could be there's a lot of crutch verbs that people use again and again. So also something to keep an eye out for when you start using similar verbs over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally, there's a lot of times where, and that's one of the other things that I wanted to, that's part of um, the things to watch out for is echoes. Uh, Oh yeah. That is one thing that (laughs) I did not realize how often I did it. And all of a sudden now it's like, I cannot turn it off. And I would like to thank my CP for really uh, training me on that. Um, So again, with kind of using verbs over and over, just watch what your crutch verbs slash echoes to be sure that um, you're not doing that too much because the reader does pick up on that, whether they intentionally know they are or not. It's something that you realize when you read the same word over and over that you're like, wait, this it sounds starts to sound repetitive and the reader can lose interest. Right. Yeah. And for sure, like, I think that word echoes and phrase echoes, that can be more than just verbs. That can be for adjectives as well. Like if you describe someone, someone's shoes as like black and then two seconds later is like the black chair. Well, I mean, that's the same adjective being used. And I think the strong word choice in general. So You can be describing, like, my personal role with, like, describing things is, like, not to use, like, more than two adjectives. If I have to, I would, like, choose one and a very strong descriptor. Mm -hmm. So you have, say, something shining, like, glinting, glimmering, sparkling. Those are all versions of something shining, but they put different kind of images in the reader's head. So the more specific and direct you are with the word choice. And one more thing on the verbs too is with adverbs, it's the same thing. If you had, he walked slowly, why don't you just say he mm. tiptoed? You know what I mean? So it's right. that as well with like trying to avoid Watch adverbs. those L-Y words. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Uh, the L, too many L-Ys. And <laughs> I'd like your, can you repeat your rule again? Because I really think that's important. Sorry, I know we're jumping all over, but that rule that you said about you only like to use one Oh, yeah, yeah. So I try to use, like, when I'm describing something... I never use more than two adjectives for the same thing because then if you have like three, it just turns into a list, like word, Mm -hmm. comma, word, comma. And I try as hard as possible to use one adjective as much as possible because I can pick a stronger word to describe what I'm trying to Mm -hmm. describe instead of using multiple to achieve the same thing. I think that's really important. I like want to highlight that. I love that rule because then also you're what I think people get confused about with line level writing is getting very close to purple prose where you're kind of overdoing it to an extent. Um, And I think a lot of people think that that's like flowery writing is good writing and it can be very simple. And I think that's a really good rule to highlight that you don't need to overdo it. Right. Less is more for sure, especially with descriptions. Like whenever you're describing the setting, I don't need three paragraphs of what this guy looks like just say it in like a couple sentences with a very impactful punch and move on and keep the action moving because I think again with these long descriptions they can definitely slow pacing and that's not what we want either Mm -hmm. right awesome so what's next on our list uh so I would love to talk about um using what we I so I don't want to totally go into what to what are the good things to do because I want everyone to take CC Lira's line level class. Like I could never talk about line level writing like CC Lira can. Like that class is the most amazing class I've ever taken. It's totally changed how I write, how I read, um, how I think about writing. It's been amazing. But um, a few things that we can mention, things to pay attention to while you're writing um, are you know, when you could add a metaphor, similes, unwords, uh, and alliteration. Speaking of unwords, something that um, I I called it out on social media, and I think it's so funny, like, Taylor Swift, uh, she used it as, <laughs> I have to bring Taylor Swift into this, Taylor Swift used this in one of her captions, but it also is a year, um, a lyric. And I was like, this is a great example how line level writing is used even in uh, music with lyrics. And I know a lot of times people suggest 
doing short form writing like poems uh, to help with line level writing. And she used an unword. Uh, I wish I could unrecall how we almost had it all. Instead of saying, you know, I don't recall, I wish I didn't recall. Saying unrecall is so powerful and a very efficient way to say um, what she is. Uh, I don't, that line in the song, but then also as she had it as a, a caption, I thought was just very powerful, along with many other ways that she, how she has written on this latest album is very powerful. And I think great examples of what line level writing can be. For instance, um, her lyrics, oh, this is just, beauty is a beast that roars down on all fours, demanding more. Only when your girlish glow flickers, just so do they let you know. The metaphor is just like very powerful. And I think there's another one um, where she talks about being a sore, like with a coven, a sorceress around a table. And to me, it's like such a great visual because she's with her girlfriends at out to dinner at a round table and it's like they're all sorceresses talking about you know her latest heartbreak and I think that is the type of writing that really evokes a lot of emotion and why a lot of people relate to Taylor Swift right I think that there's other things that Emily Henry her writing phenomenal and Mm -hmm. she has the ability to relate to writers or to readers because of how she writes and the metaphors she uses and how it really evokes a sense of like, I get that because I was there. Right. Yeah. No, I completely understand and love all of this. And I think it's, again, it's the emotion. When you have, when you use words mm-hmm. in a way that creates an emotion and creates some kind of imagery in a way, it really pulls the reader in and they can imagine it and they can go, oh yeah, I get mm-hmm. that and I feel that. Like you want them to feel it. So I love the idea of like the alliteration, the metaphors, the rhyme and the simile, that kind of thing. And there were two more things that I wanted to bring up. The first one is sentence structure. And with this, I think this yes. is one of those things that you need to actually look for because as you and I are talking our sentence patterns naturally vary we don't speak the same sentence structures Mm -hmm. over and over and over and your narrative should also reflect natural speech and so if you have like three sentences in a row that start with prepositional phrases then it's going to start like that's one of the things that readers are going to get it and you're going to start to feel that it's like a little choppy and doesn't really flow and so Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea to be aware of your sentence structures and adding variety yes and I think it's like very important I have an example pulled up too it doesn't mean that they need to be all long sentences right I think I've seen a ton of manuscripts where it's very long sentences sentences sense to, oh my gosh why can't I say it? <laughs> uh, with a lot of commas that I think do a disservice to what the writer is trying to say and it can be what I love is when there is the sentence length variation of having a long a short a long um I have an example from um uh what the river knows by uh Isabella Banyas at first, I couldn't make sense of, sense of the sentences, and then each word crystallized, all sharp edges and harsh lines, threats, bruises, murderer. Oh that to me is like really so good. good, a great example <laughs> of how powerful sentence-like variation can be. Right, and that just totally evoked emotion, too. Like, when you got down to the mm-hmm. end, where it was like, like one word, like, I'm all for sentence fragments when it works. <laughs> Right. Uh, Rules are meant to be broken as long as you do them well. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the thing, too, is like, I think as well, when you're looking at a scene's emotion or level of tension, 
sometimes if you're in a really, really tense scene, to reflect the character's state of mind, shorter and more like fragmented sentences can show that they're scared or, you know, like very upset and they just, they don't have the coherent thought. But then maybe when you're doing like scene setting with all these pretty details, maybe like some more longer, more elaborate sentences, but then you would get back to the shorter one soon after. So I think as well, like looking at the kind of emotion that you want to create and reflect the tone of the scene or the character's mental state, I think you can also utilize the sentence structures for that as well. Totally. 100%. Awesome. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is dialogue and mm-hmm. a couple of things with this. So everybody loves dialogue tags, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And I think sometimes if you, especially when there are two characters in conversation, so you and I are talking right now, if we mm-hmm. were characters in a book, we wouldn't need blah, blah, blah. Christine said, blah, blah, blah. Demise said, blah, blah, blah. Christine mm-hmm. replied. Like, it becomes very, like, choppy and, like, not fluid and I think you can use you can definitely have like quotes standing on their own if it's clear who's speaking and I also love action beats I think those are super powerful and if you have an action beat you don't need a tag so if there was a sentence that said hi I'm leaving now I said turning toward the door or I turn toward the door you can just say hi I'm leaving now I turn toward the door so you don't need the action you can have the action beat but you don't need the dialogue tag as well yeah I think um if anyone is looking for help on that, Kathy um, Armstrong, uh, she has a great PDF that she shared on Twitter called "Kill uh, Don't Kill Your Darlings, I believe it is. Um, and it does help with identifying the uh, action beats and removing, you know, the dialogue tag with it. Um, so if you need example, that is a great resource to go check out. Yeah. So the best way to really pay attention to line level writing, like dialogue tags, is to go read a book. I like to think of prior to COVID, there's some books out there that I, I feel like the dialogue tag thing is still a little bit of a discourse. I know people really do like to use them. And there's nothing like specifically wrong with that. Um, it, it is a little bit of a taste thing. But recent books especially I think do a great job with doing beats action beats instead of dialogue tags and I feel much more engaged with that especially because it does such great scene work uh, to really get the reader immersed in scene with how the character's moving or even how they're feeling and uh, reacting to the situation. For sure absolutely and I think the great point to wrap up on is just reading books that's the best way to Mm -hmm. learn anything like Mm -hmm. if you want to understand your genre conventions better read books that have recently come out in your genre if you're struggling with setting descriptions read a book if you're struggling with line level writing read a book I think that's the best way because that's going to show you what books made it onto the shelves got agents got publishers that's what the industry is looking for and that's the standard and I think this is why authors can get a little frustrated when they think, well, my agent can help me and my editor can help me. Well, some agents are as as editorial as others. And so whenever you're querying, it's really, really, really important to make sure that your book is as polished as it needs to be on the line level. And I think sometimes people think line level means the grammar, spelling, and punctuation. That's copy yeah. editing. That's not line editing. And so I think right. that's where part of the disconnect comes from. But it's like all the things we've talked about and more, there's more things out there as well. Um, but yes. just making sure that it's... It's very polished and immersive because if you have the writing skills and it shows, it's much easier to fix the story with developmental issues because the agents couldn't know that you have what it takes to tell a story on a line level. And so it's much easier to fix story issues than writing issues. Well, and what we're doing is art. And that's been a really big reframe for me is this is art and craft and practice takes art or takes practice to make art and so we you're not just going to go out and draw a Monet today (laughs) Monet got there (laughs) Monet got there after practice and so this all takes practice and understanding craft and so you know it it I think I know a lot I was there once I was frustrated of all these things that we have to do to improve our craft 
because it is an, kind of the assumption that that is what the agent's there for. That's what the editor, the copyright editors are there for. And it's not because the threshold is having this craft level. You'll go out and see, I know a lot of people think that you can go out in a traditional or to a bookstore and pick out a traditional public published book. They might have this uh, perception of how the author might write. I promise you, you go look in there and there are good, there are good craft practices on a line level, no matter what genre, no matter what book you might have, you might think there's not, but I even say what you, I, I personally think Coho is great and Coho has Colleen Hoover has, what is it? Uh, Ugly Love. She wrote in verse, I think in one of, for one of the POVs, that's a great craft tool she was messing around with and wrote it. And I think no matter what book you're picking up, you can find something on a craft level to take away. Fantastic. So before we get into your plot twist, are there any more oh resources gosh. you would like to share? <laughs> yeah. So um, I know that we mentioned like reading, keep reading, read, read, read. You'll You'll realize, too, what kind of uh, line level tools really resonate with your voice. I think that is very distinct to recognize. Um, I think taking Cece Lira's, um, I don't know if she has one coming up, but stay tuned. I guess hopefully she'll do it again. Um, her uh, hacking level writing on a line level course, like I said, is just like so amazing. Uh, and then Matt Bell's Refuse to be Done book is really great for line level writing as well. And I really enjoyed when he, I took a course by him um, during the deep dive series. So really recommend anything that he might put out there. And there's, there's unlimited resources. If you check out Jane Friedman's website, she has a ton of resources too. So just stay eager to learn. And I think it'll all start becoming habit. For sure. And the last point I wanted to make is that this is something that's a never ending process. I'm still mm -hmm. learning every day. And I think sometimes we can get set on the big goals of I want to hold my published book in my hands. But the ultimate goal should be if you want to spend your entire life writing, I think there needs to be a level of embracing the learning experiences and having an enjoyment in developing your craft and bettering yourself as an author. 100%. All right, Christine, plot twist time. <laughs> oh, man. I am so excited. <laughs> All right, cool. So yours is a fun one. So if somebody gave you the opportunity to open a publishing-themed restaurant, what would you call it? What would be on the menu? And how would you decorate it? Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> I This is like my dream. I would love to. Okay, so does it have to be a restaurant or could I do... A winery okay sure winery let's do that I would want to try and figure out like a play on like one last sip but like also one last page or something I don't know there's there's already like a wine and bookshop in Chicago called the bookseller so I couldn't oh, do that oh that's a good one what about wine I and know. spines oh I like that <laughs> okay oh my gosh yes uh I mean you're you literally this is my dream I'm telling you I someday if if I ever make it big somehow in this industry, that would be like a dream to have a restaurant with books. Um, <laughs> what was the other part of the, what was the other part of the question? Um, how would you decorate it? And uh, oh. what certain things would be on the menu? Like along with the wine, would you sell anything else? Okay. Uh, cheese. A lot, a lot of cheese. Um, <laughs> so for wine and cheese pairing. Um, and let's see, how would I decorate it? So there, there's this, bar in New York that is like I think you go to the bar and you like can read and it's just like the walls are just bookshelves and like I would love just wall very dark ambiance you know um and with really good mood lighting like no overhead lighting just lamps oh I like that and uh lush <laughs> like chaise lounges and leather like those like very um, studious leather uh, sofas and cushy blankets and like probably a lot of plants too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I basically I'd probably try and decorate it like the place in New York because if I ever make it to New York, I'm going to spend a lot of time there. Um, <laughs> I don't know the name of it though off cool. the top of my head. 
Well, hopefully you can open this one day and we all can go hang out. Oh, that would be great. Awesome. I that that's such a dream. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, it was such a joy having you on this show. Can you please share with everybody where they can connect with you online and check out everything to do with you as an agent if they're interested in querying you for representation? Yeah. So I am on Twitter and uh, Instagram and threads at Seagoss Agent. And you can find me, my manuscript wish list on my own website, Christine Kelly Writes. Uh, dot com. Uh, and uh, I'm currently closed to queries. I at one point thought I would be open soon, but um, stay, I always update Twitter to be sure that you're aware when I'm opening and closing. Fantastic. Well, I'm so excited for all that you have coming. Good luck with your future journey as an agent. Thank I hope you. you get lots of fabulous clients and lots of book deals. And it was a joy having you on the show. Oh, I loved this. I I hope it's helpful for everyone. And um, I just really want to emphasize how important line level writing is. So please, please just everyone try and learn as best you can because it really does make all the difference. It definitely does. And that is a wrap on this chapter of Literary Blend with Christine, all about line level writing. If you enjoyed our conversation, please consider leaving the podcast a review and giving it five stars to help others just like you discover it. Also, if you have friends in publishing you think would enjoy the show, please pass it along to them. Thank you for listening. And until we flip to the next chapter, happy reading and writing.